Hey, welcome to the Kingdoms Podcast. My name is Luke and I host this with my buddy Matt Ma. And our goal is to empower you to discover how your faith impacts culture for God's kingdom. To do that, we're sitting down with different men and women from all kinds of disciplines to uncover how they, through their ambitions and vocational skill set, make a difference in the lives of those around them. And so if this is helpful to you, we'd love it if you could like it, share it, and subscribe. In the meantime, enjoy today's episode. Well, friends, thanks so much for being back with us on the Kingdoms podcast. Uh, Matt and I are actually super thankful to have joining us all the way from British Columbia, Dan Hamhues. Dan, thanks so much for, for being with us today. Thanks for having me on, guys. Looking forward to the chat. Man, we are too. If you if you don't know Dan, Dan is a retired NHLer with uh, an incredible story. And uh, if you ever check out his highlight reel, some some pretty epic hip checks along the way. So uh, that's something we'll maybe dive into later. But wanted to to lead off Dan by just asking, could you maybe give us a snapshot of of your hockey journey leading to the NHL? You know, who introduced you to the game and and especially that experience of what it was like to be drafted and then start and make the starting lineup of an NHL team. Yeah, it's, uh, it started when I was four years old. My parents put me in hockey, kind of like most uh, Canadian families do with their kids, especially at that time. And um, From those early days, I played all my minor hockey in Smithers, which is quite unique, taking that path to the NHL nowadays. Um, and it was a single-A hockey organization. I grew up in a really small town, but had a very dedicated group of coaches and parents that made it work. And my dad and mom being at the forefront of that, my dad kind of helped me manage the team, coach the team in the early years. Went on all the road trips, my mom running the concession at the rink, which allowed us to have a key to the arena, which allowed us to go to those uh, 5 a.m. practices at 4 a.m. just to get a little more ice time. Nice. And uh, I think it was all those little sacrifices along the way from my parents that really allowed the opportunity to happen to continue to pursue and mm. get better at hockey. And, and I know, I don't remember too much of my childhood, in detail but what I do remember is just loving the game I never had an intention set out to make it to the NHL I just believed it was so far off for me being a small town kid but loving the game I just would wait for my dad to get home from work with a hockey stick in my hand in the driveway and he was great he'd kind of drop his stuff still in his uh, business clothes and take shots of me if I was a net or stick handle and play so tons of road hockey in the winter it'd be out in the boots uh we had a backyard rink in the summer it was rollerblading so that was kind of my childhood I was just playing and uh unstructured and I I don't know it was uh, it's kind of a neat way to make it it's, it's it's a lot more structured nowadays seeing what kids are the path to the NHL uh so from there I was uh put on a protected list for the the Prince George Cougars which is a WHL team um, I did not get drafted. I broke my leg actually right before the BC Winter Games, which would have been a showcase, especially for kids in the North that don't get seen too much. Mm. And so I missed that showcase, never got drafted, probably would have had a good chance to get drafted at that point. But the scouts in Prince George see me play the next year, allowed me to uh, make that team as a 16 year old and uh, played four years of uh, junior hockey in Prince George, which was just a cool thing to look back on actually how that broken leg kind of changed the direction of my life and my career right there. Mm -hmm. um, ended up Prince George is the closest junior hockey team to my hometown. So it just gave access for my parents to come watch a lot of games and have that support, especially those first couple of years being a young guy away from home. Um, and I had a very successful junior career that just with the coach at Dempsey and I don't know if the situation there just allowed me to excel in a way to make it to the NHL. I met my wife there. Uh, we were married there, had our first kid there. So it's just this whole little uh, diversion. That the door closes, the door opens. And yeah. that's just neat to look back on it. And with a Christian perspective, just see God's hand kind of take a, a thing that you think would be not good, a broken leg. And all of a sudden, you're like, wow, look at, look at how he, look at how that changed the path. And uh, so in my third year in junior hockey, I was drafted by the National Predators uh, and uh, my whole family came down. I was projected to go in the first round. So we were able to go to the draft and be a part of it. And uh, they got called 12th overall by the Predators, which is uh, was pretty exciting, but that was only one step. And uh, it was a lot of work to make the team. It definitely didn't happen as 
uh, easily. Um, took me a couple, took me two training camps. I guess in my third training camp, I finally cracked the roster. Uh, the first one, I went back to junior for my fourth year. And then the second one, I went for a full season uh, in Milwaukee, which is the farm team for Nashville. And then finally in the third year, I uh, cracked the lineup and ended up playing uh, 16 years in the NHL, 18 years of, of pro hockey. So it ended up being uh, quite a long career, longer than I ever expected. I kind of had in my mind once I made it to the NHL, I was like, wow, a 10 year career would be unbelievable. And then to play as long as I did was uh, yeah. a lot of cool experiences. That is an incredible story. Like, wow, to, to be playing like minor hockey, single A, and just have that uh, direction from your parents. And then, like you say, to be able to reflect and see the hand of God in it all. Um, now, as you were developing as a hockey player, you were also cultivating a relationship with, uh, with Christ. Um, who were some of the key people that influenced you as you uh, developed and molded uh, your faith? Yeah, I, was, uh, I grew up in a Christian home, went to a Christian school. We were kind of church every Sunday, except for when there was hockey. We'd be, uh, we'd be off at the hockey tournaments, uh, much to my grandmother's. Uh, she was not too happy about that, but we did. And uh, um, so that was kind of the way I grew up, went off to junior hockey. And, um, you know, there's a lot of challenges in a hockey environment. You're not with your parents anymore. I was fortunate. I had great billets that we continued to, to go to church. And I would say, you know, up, up to that point in my life, when, through junior hockey and as I transitioned into pro hockey, my... I, it was a little bit more of a knowledge thing for me. I kind of, I knew a lot about Christianity. We learned about it at our Christian school. We learned about it at church and Sunday school. Um, and it was a little bit of a kind of, I had a relationship with Christianity and not Jesus so much. And it was more of a kind of uh, what I should be doing and what I shouldn't be doing kind of view of, of Christianity and a lot of guilt associated with, you know, wrong choices and that was that was tough through junior hockey and but that's what that's what I knew when I went off to play pro hockey my first year as I mentioned I didn't make the team in Nashville I got sent down to Milwaukee and it was a really tough year for me uh, personally professionally on the ice um, you know being away from home in, Amer in a big American city uh, it, it was a challenging I didn't wasn't playing well as the youngest guy on the team so all these things kind of added up which just yeah. made it difficult teammates were kind of hard on me because i was the youngest guy and it's a weird environment in the ahl because you're teammates but at the same time you're all competing against each other to get called up to the right to the nhl it's a mm -hmm. really funny dynamic down there and uh so i, I struggled with it i didn't play, i wasn't playing well certainly playing below expectations from people and myself and then off the ice it was really interesting because now i'm on my own i had no billets i was far away from home and there was these Sundays that we wouldn't be playing. It's like, well, I, I know it's, it's church day, it's Sunday. And I kind of was like, well, no one's going to know if I don't go. So why am I going? Why would I, why would I go? Is this something that is important to me that I should go? And I was kind of at this crossroads and um, pondering a lot of the deeper questions of my career and my faith and personal life of who I am. And, um, very fortunate that year we had a great chaplain on the team in Milwaukee. His name was Iggy Caffaro and we were doing chapels a couple times a month. And I think he recognized that in me and he, he asked some very direct questions and challenged me in a lot of ways to just kind of get to the bottom of what it is that I believe. And is this what I want? And it was again, like looking back broken leg, kind of a not ideal situation opens and closes doors along the way ends up being a cool path to the NHL this year in Milwaukee was in the moment it was quite miserable and looking back at it now it was such a transitional year for me um personal personally and spiritually because that's when Christianity for me really changed from a religion to a relationship mm -hmm. and that's when things really changed for me and I had so much to learn, and even though I grew up in this for uh, probably like, well, 15 years, 20 years of growing up in that, I had so much to learn about what what it was, and still learning today, of course, and 
still uh, still trying to figure things out, but it really set the path as I've moved on through my career, just a whole different perspective yeah. of Christianity and developing that relationship. Yeah. yeah, man, super significant people like those chaplains that we have along the way. And yeah, grateful that you had that exposure. Obviously it was super formative. And I wondered to kind of continue on that theme, not only of your experience in Milwaukee, but you know, you, you become a full-time NHL, or if you will, you, you, you break into the lineup with the predators and it's not easy to be both a professional athlete and a follower of Jesus. You know, I'm sure you felt that in that season in Milwaukee, but it, you know, the spotlight, the expectations, all the pressures that they come along with that. So after making the Preds roster, who are some of the key Christian athletes that were kind of being an example for you saying, this is what it looks like to be both a, a pro athlete, uh, but also a follower of Jesus. And maybe in that saying, you know, here's some really good things you can choose to do some disciplines you can have. And here's some really good, maybe boundaries to avoid some of the, some of the maybe unhealthy expectations that can come with being a professional athlete. What did that process look like? Yeah, the, uh, there's certainly the lure of the bright lights of uh, the big cities and the NHL lifestyle. And you, you're rich, you're famous, you've got all these things going on and you're young and yeah, it can be, there's, there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of lures. There's life, lifestyle choices you can make that, you know, aren't, aren't great as a, as a crit representing a Christian, what it is to be a Christian. And also it kind of parallels. They're usually not great for hockey careers either late nights mm -hmm. and putting the wrong things in your body can sh shorten a career quite quickly as well. Yeah. Um, I, man, being drafted to Nashville was, was such a great thing. Being a, from a small town in Northern BC and being able to go to a city like Nashville kind of out of the spotlight, pretty quiet place for the NHL. And to grow up there in my career um, was really good. I think it would have been a challenge to grow in a start a career in a big city or under the spotlight of a Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver type of place. Um, but we had a great coach, Barry Trotz. He was uh, almost like a father figure, really cared about his players. And uh, along with that, we had some really great teammates. Some of the older guys on our team are captain Greg Johnson, uh, Scott Walker, Stu Grimson was around and we had, uh, and we had probably seven, eight guys that were showing up to chapels. And, uh, so I started going to that and that was just neat to see. It was neat to kind of get to know the guys outside the small talk and the jokes of the dressing room, but to mm. see a, a deeper side of some of the players and to talk with them, they were excited that I was a part of it, which was made me feel very welcome. And, and the chaplain, his name is Pike Williams. Um, him and I have developed an incredible relationship over the years. I was fortunate at the end of my career to go back to Nashville for two more seasons and Pike and I've stayed in touch. His wife and my wife, um, kind of have a bit of a mentoring relationship as Pike and I do. And, uh, so when I came back as an older player to rekindle that relationship with Pike and his wife, Leslie was, was a really neat thing, but yeah, I mean, those guys, the like Craig Johnson, those veteran guys on the team, just seeing that it was okay it was okay to say you know what guys i'm i'm just gonna stay in tonight or i'm gonna you know what i'm gonna choose not to do this i'm gonna choose to to do that instead um you know the fact that they did it gave me a lot more courage to to make some decisions maybe not go along with the group and try and you know i think as a christian you don't want to make it awkward and um you know make a big stance or you know just kind of did our thing no one kind of looks at you as like, oh, such a strange duck or anything. And, um, you know, still, still being a great friend and a great teammate, but just making a few different choices here and there. And what I really found was as I looked upon these veteran guys that were leading that charge and gave me the courage, um, as I started to make these decisions too, guys respect it. Guys, uh, guys respect when you have, when you are standing on something solid and you have a backbone and maybe they don't agree with it, but the fact that you stand for something I think goes a long ways and I think it garnered actually a lot of respect in the room. And as a young player, you get worried that maybe you'll be picked on or they'll mm -hmm. think you're weak or these things. And it was funny. It actually kind of ended up being the opposite. Yeah. Wow. It's interesting how like, you know, sports are such a disciplined environment. And uh, oftentimes when you're in those environments, you know, when it comes to like late night parties and stuff like that, uh, you think that you're going to be like judged for it, but there's almost something about like being morally disciplined uh, that, like you said, like what you put in your body matters. And uh, sometimes 
people can honor that too. It's pretty cool. Um, you also talked about adversity and uh, in your first season with the Vancouver Canucks, you made it to the Stanley Cup finals only to face uh, a season ending injury following your team's elimination uh, to the Boston Bruins. Um, in the face of that personal injury and, and obviously the ensuing disappointment, um, how did you persevere and overcome those setbacks? Yeah, that one was uh, specifically was really tough, tough to deal with. Um, mm. Playing for Vancouver, a team I grew up watching, being in Stanley Cup finals, and it was a dream come true. And to have to be taken out of the series because of an injury was was tough. It was a couple tough days when I found out the news that I wouldn't be playing anymore. And uh, then it made it even harder, just the way we went out to being so close, winning, you know, up three games to one at one point. And yeah. I don't know, what were we? We were up two nothing and three two, one win away from the Stanley Cup. And uh, to not secure the victory was, it was tough to watch, tough to not to be a part of, but, um, you know, I've had quite a few injuries and setbacks in my career. I've had, uh, you know, a puck to the face that took me out for a while, different pretty serious groin injuries and some MCL stuff later on. And it's never where you really want to be, right? It, as a professional athlete, competitive guy, a teammate, I want to be there for my teammates. I want to be on the ice put all this effort and work in to get your skills dialed in your conditioning, just everything kind of clicking and you're feeling good out on the ice and then boom, something happens and you're out for eight weeks and you got to start, you know, this is going to be a mountain to climb to get back to that level again. And it takes a while. And uh, so it can be frustrating hmm. and yeah, it's, it's tough. It's a tough spot. What I tried to do, I, I guess I had a lot of practice at it with the injuries that I had is, one thing I'd always do is just kind of ask myself, like, man, what, what's the opportunity? Like, how, how can I use this? And I, I was far enough removed kind of from the broken leg and that year in Milwaukee too, where I was able to look back on those things. And I think one of the most powerful things as Christians to share is, is our testimonies. And, and sometimes it's not always just sharing it to other people, trying to um, share our faith with them. But even to convince ourselves, I find it really powerful to look back on our own testimonies and, and record stuff, record what you prayed for, record how maybe God answered it in a journal. And I found it really powerful to look back on these situations and these prayers that have been answered in a certain way. Sometimes it's the next day, sometimes it's a week, sometimes it's years before you see what happened there. And I was enough removed where I was like, huh, you know, God's done some really cool things in the past when dealing with these situations hmm, i'm kind of curious like what what might happen here i wonder why why would i be out now it just does not seem like great timing but so i kind of had this curious mindset and from there i'd also like okay what what's the opportunity in this i'm like well it's mid-season hmm, maybe the rest is not a bad thing i'll be all rested up for the playoffs it'll give me an opportunity to rehab come back stronger give me some more time with my family, with the kids, maybe like more and more attendance at church because I wasn't on road trips. And all of a sudden I'd make a new friend at the church and, you know, things change. And it's, yeah. And I, and I think it, it all starts just with that mindset at the start. Obviously it's not a place you want to be, um, but what's the opportunity? Why am I here? And I think that perspective really kind of helped me. And as I work through those, Again, looking back at these situations, it kept building and building. It's building more trust, more confidence in my relationship with God that, you know, Romans 8, 28, he truly, um, you know, is looking for good for those who love him. Or, and, yeah. uh, and, you know, that, that was a verse that really was a big part of one of my favorite ones for such a long time uh, through my hockey career. Because I truly believe that and seen it and experienced it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to, to go from a question that, that dials into some disappointment and difficulty, you know, on the flip side, in 2014, you competed for Canada in the Winter Olympics. And we know how that turned out. And as a Canadian, I, I'm feeling just like pumped just, just talking about it with you. But, uh, you know, what was it like to represent your country, uh, to play with some of the world's elite hockey players, and, and obviously to, to win gold, to be an Olympic gold medalist? And, you know, even as the overflow of that, what maybe were some of the things that you saw, doors that were open, because it's like, here's Dan, Dan Ham Hughes, 
He's a gold medalist and people want to talk to you, hear about your story, learn about your faith as a result of that. So can, can you share a little bit about that experience and, and that, that victory? Yeah, it was pretty, pretty surreal to be named to that team uh, in 20, I think it was maybe January 1st of 2014. They named the team right around, right around Christmas, New Year's. Mm. Uh, it took a while for it to kind of sink in. And even after coming back from Sochi, it took a while to sink in what had actually transpired. And even now today, it's like you see the Olympics on TV. And it's like, wow, I was part of that. And, yeah. and it's, it's pretty cool. But that process started a long time ago in 2004. Five, I was working with my trainer in Vancouver and Vancouver had just got, uh, um, awarded the 2010 Olympics. Yeah. So we made it a goal that it would be, in, I would like to play for the 2010 Olympic team and represent Canada. And, uh, so I got invited to the summer camp in 2009. And then, uh, so that was a great first step. And then into, and then when they named the team that year, they phoned me and said, sorry, <laughs> we're, uh, you had a great camp, but uh, we're going to go in a different direction. Well, it's very nice of you to call. Thank you. <laughs> and anyway, so that five-year goal turned into a nine-year goal. And I was mm. like, okay, I, uh, I would like, I want to go to the next, do the next one and kind of bear down a little harder, worked on my skating, worked on my mental game, worked on a whole bunch of pieces mm. and really started the, the grind of kind of pursuing excellence in my career of turning over every stone and finding out how to be on the cutting edge of uh, training and nutrition and recovery and I think it really paid off because in 2014 I, I got named to the team so it's kind of a neat neat story and goal setting I have actually written down in a journal that I had from 2013 it says I will make the Olympic team I will win gold and uh, so I share that with kids often at, at school uh -huh. just uh, the power of saying things out loud the power of writing them down and the power of saying it that way of I will not I want to and hmm. uh, so it's kind of it was a neat yeah, experience in goal setting but being at the olympics man was that ever fun it was yeah being a part of the hockey team but the thing i didn't fully expect was how cool it was to feel a part of the entire canadian olympic team mm -hmm. you know cheering on the skiers and the snowboarders and the figure skaters and the speed skaters and watching their events and they're coming to yours and skiing in the athletes village hearing their stories it was really cool and uh, my wife came over so we got to share it together and and then just to top it all off, winning on the last day, closing yeah. ceremonies and the parties. So, um, so much fun. Uh, but yeah, you're right. It, it did open up a lot of doors uh, coming back um, to Vancouver. I was playing in Vancouver at the time. So I was able to kind of leverage that platform and speak at a lot of churches and schools and share that experience and um, what that was like. Well, for, for one Canadian who was up early in the morning to watch Canada versus Sweden on that pretty sure it was a Sunday morning back in 2014. Thanks for uh, representing the country well and, and for that victory. It's, uh, yeah, it still feels good. It still feels good today. It's a, it's a sweet win. And thanks for sharing your memories from that too. Well, as we uh, kind of come to the end of this section, uh, you were, as, as has been mentioned before, you were known as quite the tough competitor, whether it was like those hip checks that Luke had mentioned before or the, the slap shot that you took to the face. Um, from Dan Boyle, definitely a tough character. As a competitor, uh, where did you kind of like draw the line between sort of like intense and dirty? And then this, this was a big question for me, honestly, as a hockey player, and I don't think I did well. And I didn't play at the level you did. But what do you think it looks like to glorify God uh, while also giving your best on the ice? Well, those are questions that... Uh probably talk for days on and I've battled around in my mind for years and years and years of finding that line of you know the, being a uh, respectful competitive player and what's crossing the line what's the image what's my image of fighting and this and so trying to find where that fit in it's probably a little bit different for each person mm. and but it was something that I was sensitive to and aware of throughout my career and trying to, to find, to tow that line, to tow that line. And I think as you know, the sport, you kind of know what's, what's dirty and what, what crosses that line. And a lot of it's the chirping and what you're saying and how you're hitting. And, but not only that, I think it's also in your work ethic and your discipline and what you do. And that was a big part of it for me is, um, you know, I, I was, 
I, it was probably a little bit more later in my career I finally developed so, the maturity to just understand like what an unbelievable gift God has given me for this talent to be able to play for this opportunity like the broken like all these things these people in my life these coaches the junior team this all this stuff that just led to me being able to play in the NHL and having that kind of that heart of gratitude it's really made me want to make the most of what I've been given like how can I use these abilities I don't still want to let them go to waste I don't want to have a just show up and have a lazy practice complaining about everything but having that kind of humility and gratefulness of where I was and these gifts I've been given to play as hard as I can and you know I think some of the fiercest competitors I play against are guys like Shane Doan Mark Shifley, who you, you guys have interviewed before. Um, Mike Fisher is another guy. These guys were the hard, like they were the hardest guys to play against. And they just had this edge about them. But at the same time, you respected them so much out there because they didn't cross that line. They weren't saying dumb things out there and chirping over the line and um, played a very respectful game. And it brought out the best of me when I was playing physical, when I was hitting and staying within the, the boundaries of the game. And that was one thing I always tried to do was just to, play a game that would honor God in a way. And I think honoring him in the hockey world is giving everything you got competitively, physically. Um, but at the same time, staying within, within those uh, boundaries. You know, I think the other part is that sometimes I think Christians, non-Christians are a little, hockey players or athletes can be a little hesitant to want to, explore Christianity and I don't know if I want to come to chapel because it might make me weak I don't want to be lovey-dovey out on the ice I want to, like I play with an edge that's that's my game and uh what I have found in my experience as being as my faith has grown as a as a Christian is that I have found when hockey isn't the number one thing in my life when God has become the, the number one thing my hockey career actually has gotten better. My game has gotten better. Right. And the fact that not everything is riding on a wins and losses, my life's not riding on how I played that night, how many goals I got, how many assists I got, my fulfillment satisfaction is not coming from the coach after a great game saying, great job, although that does feel great. And I did, that was always nice when you got the, highlights on the video reel the next day but on the flip side when you were the guy making this mistake and giving one up the middle and it's on the video the next day um you know that could if everything in me was all about pleasing the coach and that's where I hung my hat on for my fulfillment satisfaction in my life that would have been awful it could have been a tough day and the coach is a human guy too and he has his ups and downs and he's emotional and if that's where I'm hanging my hat on and for my peace and satisfaction, fulfillment, and what I'm looking to achieve is impress this guy or the statist statisticians, my goals and assists, how I'm playing, how the team does. It's just going to be this up and down emotional roller coaster and really hard to deal with. And I found with my Christian faith and seeing a bigger picture than hockey of God, why am I here? Um, I'm here to love and to serve my teammates. Love you, love you, God, love and serve my teammates. How can I help? What's the bigger picture here? And I want to honor and glorify you with my hockey. And when that was my mindset and it was hard, it wasn't always just, that's the way it was for me. It was a struggle to want to put on a show for the fans or for my coach or for the stats because stats led to bigger contracts. And that's always nice too. And so you have all these things that are drawing you away from that. But when I was able to cultivate a, that pure mind of, I am just so grateful for these gifts you've given me and I want to honor you with this position. I played my best hockey. I just had this sense of lightness about me. I had this sense of freedom. The, the pressure came off and I was like, you know what? My, de or my definition of success changed hmm. and success maybe at that before that was goals, assists and having a good game. And then what it changed for me there is my definition of success after was, can I look at myself in the mirror after and know that I gave everything I had? Maybe I would, was a little bit injured and I didn't play as good as I did before, but that day with that sore leg, did I give everything I had? And I believe that 
took so much pressure off not being so result focused, but process focused and process focused because I was God focused. I wanted to honor him with my process. I can't always control those results. And there are so many times in my career where it'd just be stressful and the pressure would get to me and it would be so hard. And, but to park that and find that rest in Jesus that he talks about, man, it was just so freeing to play that way. And, uh, I wish I was bad. I wish I would have been better at it earlier in my career. I started to develop maturity and processes to um, build that as I got older, but it was, uh, it was a special place to be. Yeah. Yeah. That's so fair, man. Yeah. And uh, it does, it does say a lot between work ethic and, and hustle and heart. It speaks so loud. Uh, maybe to pivot with you though, Dan, you know, a little bit away from, from actual competing in different experiences in hockey to just talking a little bit about your your community involvement. I know when you were playing with the Canucks, you were really involved in their autism network, serving serving young people in that community. So obviously there's an open door for that. People are probably pumped to see a, a pro athlete contribute to the community on that level. But I'd love to know how did your faith inform what drove you to, to reach out to these young people to serve them to be a part of this autism network? What was that experience like for you, especially as a follower of Jesus? Yeah, well, whenever we went to a new city and at the start of each season, um, you know, my wife and I would chat and I would have some personal reflection time a few times throughout the year and just kind of pull myself back, step back and take a look and say, okay, we signed a contract in Vancouver. And you know, what does this look like for the next six years? What do we, what, what, how can we serve this community? And let's, let's shift it from what can this city give us and how, what can this team and organization, how can they serve me, but try to, how can we serve this dressing room? How can we serve this organization? How can we serve this community? So that was kind of the way we went into um, these different places. So it was, it was Vancouver in 2010 and then I signed in Dallas in 2016 and then back in Nashville in 2018. And that was the mindset that we took. So it started, I mean, just in, in small things in, in the dressing room with the guys, um, you know, how can I serve my teammates? How can I help the young guys? How can we have, how can I have deeper conversations with guys than just the, the, the stuff that you talk about at a dressing room, the chit chat, the chirps and critiquing each other's outfits and hairdos and stuff. And, and then into the community, which you mentioned is, you know, we recognize that we have such a platform as professional athletes where people enjoy hearing what we have to say and, um, you know, we're on TV. And so how can I, how can I use this fame, this publicity that I have to make a difference in the community? And I was fortunate to play with organizations, all three of those organizations that were very community focused and they provided so many opportunities for the players to, <laughs> they made us look really good at by providing, you know, visits to the hospital, everything's all set up and we're spending time with families and going into schools and working with um, organizations like Canucks Autism Network. And uh, man, I just wanted to take advantage of, of all this opportunity. And it was so much fun to, to be a part of it too. And just simply showing up in a Jersey to a children's hospital where these parents and kids have been going through mm. times, it's hard to even understand what they go through. And, um, and to be able to walk into a room without even saying anything, just wearing a Jersey and it just lights up the room was, was a pretty cool experience. And wow. certainly grateful to be able to, to do that. And, um, the Canucks autism network was, um, something that was a big part of the Canucks, uh, or one of our owners there had a son with autism and he was very passionate about, um, that foundation and they've, you know, autism is something that so many people are touched by. And it was province wide in BC. So it's just, it was real easy to get behind and try to learn more and understand what it was and the struggles. It's really, the, it's really hard on the parents. It's a, it's a tough one. Um, and how to help the kids and give them some opportunities to be in social environments, be in sporting environments at a level that's comfortable for them and that they can enjoy. And um, man, that organization did such a great job. I was just lucky to be you know, called on to be a part of it and happy to volunteer for it. That's so cool. Um, like when you think of social engagement and the three cities that you actually just mentioned, whether it's Nashville or Dallas, you know, uh, places that at least historically have been quite uh, influenced by Christianity and has a population uh, that, that is still quite firmly grounded 
in uh, Christianity. Um, but then Vancouver, in some ways, is, is very, like, post-Christian. Uh, what was your experience of, like, engaging the, the culture and uh, society at large in those two very different settings? You're right. It, it was very different. Um, we were kind of in the Bible Belt in the South there in Dallas and Nashville, and it wasn't a question of, do you go to church? It was, what church do you go to? Yeah. And uh, there's, it was very common and part of, you know, regular social interactions to speak about, you know, a church on Sunday and this and that. And um, when we went to Vancouver, it was a bit, it was a bit different. It was, uh, there wasn't as big of a Christian influence. It certainly wasn't talked about as much. So that first year was a tough transition for us, especially spiritually coming from Nashville into Vancouver hmm. and trying to find our, our spot, find a new church home. And which is tough to do to go to church as a family on Sundays, there wasn't a lot of options and, or not options for churches, but many days where I was off to be able to do that together. So when we did, we tried out a few churches and we ended up finding a really great one at the end of the year and um, kind of stuck with it through those six years at, at Westside. And it was, it was a great one for us. We, we were fed or had a great Sunday school program, but it took a while. And it was funny, even coincidentally, the, the team in Vancouver, they didn't have a chaplain at the time. And uh, so that was something that I was kind of, I don't know how I, kind of got tasked with that uh, or took it upon myself that felt it was important that our team have it and have that opportunity, even though there maybe wasn't guys looking for it. And so um, we started a chapel program that year, got a guy in that's just been really great for the team. And um, that's still going on today with the same guy 11 years later. So it's, it's kind of, and it's growing. I mean, it, it ebbs and flows, right? You get some years, there's seven, eight guys, other years, there's just one or two. My last year in Nashville, we had about 10 or 11 guys there. So it's just kind of neat how it, it, it does ebb and flow, but so great to have that uh, there for guys, just, you know, someone to just to talk to them a little bit more than just hockey. What can you, what have you done for me lately? How are you performing on the ice for it? Having that chaplain there to talk about, oh, how, you know, how's your relationship with the parents? How are things? How's the marriage? Or if you have some, things going in your life, going on in your life, in your personal life, just knowing there was someone there in your court that cared about you personally and was hoping for you to do well in hockey, but that wasn't nearly as important as the personality thing. And um, so, yeah, that was something that was important for me to want to do in Vancouver. And then we went back to Dallas and Nashville, and then we were back in the Bible Belt again. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty fortunate to play in it's just different types of cities and cities where um you know my faith grew in different ways and in, in each one yeah no that's awesome man and uh, i've never been to dallas but vancouver's got a lot to offer as a city and nashville is so much fun uh, i've loved times spent in nashville so glad you got to leave your mark on those those communities through your through your career uh dan as, as we land the plane we're we're super grateful to have this chance to connect with you to hear about your faith your your athletic journey to the nhl and, and so much more and you know if people are saying like this is awesome we'd love to connect with or, or learn more about dan we we respect that uh, not everyone has a, a big online presence but uh, if people were interested what would you point them to <laughs> come up this is come up the smithers <laughs> you walking around town because I don't have a lot of, uh, I don't do any social media, uh, just something I've, yeah, kind of preferred a, a bit of a private, uh, private life with the family, but uh, always enjoy interacting and talking about faith and hockey. So. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So for, if you're dialed in listening, so if you're ever in Smithers, BC and you see, you see Dan, you're welcome to say, Hey, but Dan, thank you for taking the time to do this today. We're really grateful we can share your story with our listeners and, and really appreciate you and your ongoing testimony uh, as both as a retired NHLer, but just as a man who's walking with God. So thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me.